Um, so I, I'm going to have, this is a very different type of talk in terms of a physician um, talking, uh, doing CME, because it's been a long time. I used to be on that. So I actually don't have specific objectives. But I would say the biggest thing for this, especially as physicians, is to really take a step back and to think about all the things. We think a lot about what makes us ill and how to get people better. But in medicine, ironically, we don't think a lot about what keeps us healthy and how do we keep people healthy. So that's really the, the point. Um, I don't have any um, specific uh, financial disclosures other than the fact that I work at Deloitte. So I'm going to um, say a little bit about innovation. I think especially since we're here in Silicon Valley, we often think about innovation and we're thinking about uh, you know, the next iPhone or the next, uh, maybe next EMR, <laughs> hopefully it will come out of today. Um, but we're not thinking about um, things like poverty or food insecurity. And um, so when I think about innovation, I really think it's more about connecting the dots and allowing us to see new possibilities. Richard Branson says ABCs of companies always be connecting the dots. And I think particularly now in terms of medicine, the, the New England Journal of Medicine just came out. There was a, the work that was happening in Camden, really trying to hotspot, right? So um, people who are more are sicker in the health system, trying to really hotspot and support them. And unfortunately, in this randomized control trial, they showed, well, it didn't really have the impact in terms of reducing readmissions, right? So a lot of us who've been doing this work, you get sad. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of it is that the underlying communities where a lot of these people are living that have worse health outcomes uh, actually are still unhealthy, and we still need to change those things. So I'm going to share a little bit about my own path as a physician, um, some of the key projects I've worked on, and then I think the big lessons in terms of connecting the dots. Um, so one, I, I um, actually did my training here at UCSF. I did uh, the pediatric leadership for the underserved program and spent a lot of time working in pediatrics. A lot of what really drove me to go and to work with kids was that I thought, oh, there's this huge opportunity to prevent, you know, to do prevention after rotating through all the different services um, in, in terms of, of really thinking about how do we, you know, as we heard earlier today, thinking about prediabetes, how do we prevent that? And, um, and kids are just super cute, right? <laughs> I mean, they're so cute. How can you go wrong? Um, but what I quickly realized, and, you know, and I think one of the things was, um, there, was an, there were amazing healthcare teams, right? So we had some of the most impressive, cutting edge work that was happening. But at the same time, a lot of the kids that I was taking care of um, were actually suffering from adult diseases. So even though I went into pediatrics, um, what I was seeing was that a lot of the kids had things like diabetes. In fact, in pediatrics, we actually changed the, the terminology, so, right? It was um, adult onset diabetes became type 2 diabetes. We started even changing the screening recommendations. So we were, cha we were screening kids as young as 2 for high cholesterol, liver function impacts, um, and, and a whole host of things. There were a lot of kids who were depressed, who were suicidal at very young ages, had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. And so it was all of this that really led me to, I, at the time I was at Stanford and I was directing the community pediatric and child advocacy rotation, but recognized that there were bigger societal things um, to start to have an impact. So at the time um, when I was at Stanford, we actually had a rotation that went. Um, so anyway, so basically, um, as we were working with a lot of the community partners, we were working with the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, Head Start. Uh, we were working with a number of different uh, community programs, right? How do we start to change the community environments, thinking about community planning? Unfortunately, at the same time that I was doing this work, a lot of the families would come in. So we were trying to do healthy activity, but they, we recognized that they actually didn't have access to healthy food, right? Or we were trying to get them to be active, and it was actually not safe in their environment to go out and, and be physically active and to play. And so I got really interested in thinking about how do we start to shift these drivers of health, these, these big systemic things in our community, but as a physician, right? Because all of these things tend to be outside of our control. So I actually left uh, clinical practice um, and joined the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Um, here, for those of you who aren't from California, it's about uh, 40 million people in the state. Um, we're the fifth largest economy. Uh, and a lot of really innovative work was happening at the time in the Office of Planning and Research, which, en which ends up working like a think and do tank for the state of California. But what it was really interesting was one of the first things that we were tasked with was working on a long-range planning um, strategy for the state of California. 
So all of the decisions that are made in terms of how we plan for our communities, where parks go, where housing goes, where we think, how we think about food access, a lot of that actually happens through long range planning. And so we actually had this opportunity to meet with folks across the state. So it was really a very different kind of thinking, right? How do we shift these, these um, communities? One of the things, the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation's done a ton of great work, and you can see this. There's a lot that's been published in JAMA. But we can actually see life expectancy vary by up to 20 years in the same community. That actually exists in every community across the US. And we see that even here. If you look in, in Oakland, um, where I spent a number of years living, we could see huge variances in terms of life expectancy. And so as you start to think about how do you bring people together to change these systems, it was pretty exciting. So one of the things I think, and this is especially in terms of innovation in medicine, I think part of it is there's a huge opportunity to start to reach outside of our clinical walls. I think as physicians, we end up uh, focusing a lot of what we're doing within the hospital or trying to make changes, even though it's hard with the <laughs> electronic health records, as we heard. But it's sometimes it's really taking that step back and thinking about the other people that we can bring to the table to help us solve these problems. So one of the things, this is actually um, all of these different names are different uh, folks that we, we partnered with and worked with as we did community outreach across the state. And it was a blank slate. There was no other state that had policies like this systematically in place to think about how to put things into the community to plan them um, appropriately. So we engaged with state agencies. We had a lot of conversations. Um, and what the outcome was was actually a policy recommendation document for the state of California that now has a lot of these things in terms of integrating healthy policies into land use planning across the state. There are recommendations to think about how we integrate active transportation, walking, biking, um, food systems, so thinking about food insecurity. So a number of programs we're starting to hear you know, more and more about the social determinants of health and programs that are screening uh, individuals to basically wrap around and do referral services. But what if we think about changing the community environment so that they actually have access to the healthy food in the first place? Also, things around um, promoting clean air, clean water, and healthy environments. This is a big one in terms of different exposures, air quality. You know, I, when I was in clinical practice, a lot of the families that we worked with who were suffering from asthma were exposed to poor air quality. And so rather than having to think about increasing medication doses or increasing things, it was like, can we actually shift and have healthier environments in the home? And I think one of the, so basically of the key areas, there was a lot of different um, areas. We had active living and recreation, healthy housing, environmental health, social cohesion, economic opportunity, even climate change and human services. So this was really pretty groundbreaking work. I think what um, was also really exciting was that we started to move a, com a committee of folks across the state with partners in planning, in public health, and um, a lot of our different community partners. One example, um, as we brought folks together to think about operationalizing this was venture capital. We brought together innovation vice presidents from different health systems and actually were able to start a food system accelerator to think about how to operationalize these policies. But what I want to transition to is that I think there's a huge opportunity that's happening right now, especially as we transition to technology-enabled medicine. I think for a long time what we've seen is that a lot of the work in this that's been more traditionally public health focused, not health, fo not health systems focused, has gone down this path um, that's very devoid and separate from the health system, from thinking about actually tracking real-time data or real-time world evidence. So there's this convergence right now happening around the micro to the macro and back to the micro. And that's with precision health and medicine. So one of the other things that was happening at the state um, of California at the time was we launched a precision health and medicine initiative, which is really exciting because what we've tended to do is think about people as they live in their community separate from uh, what's happening, right? We do clinical trials, we ask these big questions, but now we're at a time where we're starting to have more real world evidence um, to make these connections that are powered by data. Um, so how our data is interacting is shifting, and I, I want to mention there's a, a, a program basically for an asthma inhaler. Um, this is uh, Propeller Health. They've, they've done um, this work and they've actually monitored 
our exposure, right? And so we tended to think about when people come into the clinical setting, asking them about their asthma symptoms, and we know that there's, it's very tough in terms of remembering when someone's used something. But at this point now, we're starting to get to the capacity with technology to have GPS-enabled sensors to track. And they've done this. There's some really exciting work that's been published. And so um, as we're bringing people together for partners collaboration, I think there's a huge opportunity with precision health and medicine to be thinking about more real-world evidence. Um, one of the things we actually also did was we put together a report on for the governor, the previous governor, for the incoming governor and the legislature on all of the different things to be thinking about in terms of precision health and medicine. What was really fascinating was the social, economic, and environmental factors is a huge opportunity as we think about integrating real world evidence um, at this point. So I just want to close. I think that it's a, a huge opportunity that we have before us in terms of medicine, starting to reach out to other partners and thinking about prevention in very novel ways. Um, as we know, it's hard to change behavior. And so I think it's not only about behavior change, but it's also changing communities to be able to have uh, better health. So thank you.